Well, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to encourage you to turn to Matthew chapter 22. And uh, if you don't, we're going to uh, read them out of, the, out of your bulletin. Uh, we had a little glitch on the computer this morning, so if you'll look on the bulletin, I want to read a couple of passages for you today. And then I'm going to talk about organic Christianity. And uh, the idea in my mind came together pretty cool, and I hope it makes sense to you today. If so, I think it'll be a real good service for all of us. Organic Christianity. All right, Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse 34. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Circle that. If you have your Bible or on your bulletin, circle that. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Now, I don't think I put this in your bulletin, but I want to read another scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles, 1 Corinthians 1. It's just two verses. You can follow me if you don't have it. I don't think it's in your bulletin, but 1 Corinthians 1, 18, 19. Paul writes, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. I love the first part. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. One more scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I think in your bulletin, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, if you have your Bibles. Again, Paul writes, But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preach, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. And I love the way the King James says this one verse, chapter 11, verse 3. The King James Version says it like this. But I fear lest it, by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted, here's the phrase, from the simplicity that is in Christ. Think about that phrase. Paul is saying, I don't want you to be led astray or beguiled like Eve was led astray or your mind be corrupted from the, you may want to write this on your little outline, simplicity that is in Christ. The simplicity that is in Christ. All right, I want to talk about organic Christianity. Before we get into it, I had to talk about the word organic. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the term organic in your grocery shopping? How many of you do organic grocery shopping? I know we have Gloria Wynn. I know she sits on the board of uh, Sevenanda, Sevenanda in uh, Little Five Points, the best health food store, whole foods kind of a store you can find. Uh, organic foods are kind of a big deal. And Christians especially, I think, should be thinking about healthy living holy for, our, for ourselves. Uh, it, it's, it's funny to me that sometimes those of us that know the Lord have struggled the most with taking care of our bodies. Not making fun, but I've had people who come up to me and say, Ray, I need you to help me with something. I need you to pray, because the doctor says I got this spot on my lung, but I just believe, because of Jesus, that I'm going to be healed. And it's like, I'll pray for you, but, but maybe we should try to live a little healthier, try to live a little healthier. Jane and I are trying to do that with food. Now, here's a definition for organic. It means produced or involving production without the use of chemical fertilizers or pesticides or other artificial agents. In other words, it means foods without additives, without things that they put on top of it that, that sometimes make it poison 
not food. So let me stay on the food thing just for a minute. You want to see a cool documentary. It came out several years ago. It's called Super Size Me. How many of y'all ever saw that documentary? It's about McDonald's. And uh, again, I know there are days when McDonald's is, is probably what you've got to eat, but this producer, Morgan Spurlock, health food guy, decides for 31 days he's going to eat nothing but McDonald's food, breakfast, lunch, supper. He's never done this. His body is used to pure foods. 31 days just to kind of video what's happening as he goes to the doctor and they check his vital signs. He almost dies. He almost dies. Everything in his body goes haywire. At one point in the movie, they decide to see how foods decompose. And so they put ordinary foods under glass, and they see how after a few days they begin to decompose. They put a French fry for McDonald's under glass. Do you know it never decomposes? Some of y'all probably have French fries under the seat of your car that are years old, I bet. <laughs> years. Do you know if you got that French fry out and you heated it in the microwave, it tastes just like it tasted the day that it was made? That's not natural. That's not normal food. And some of you just need to be aware of that. So anyway, organic food is kind of a cool thing. Jane and I are trying. We try to do it as best we can. Here's my definition of organic Christianity, if you want to write this on your outline. The message of Christ before all the add-ons. The message of Christ before all of the add-ons. Now, when Jesus walked the earth, his message was simple. His crucifixion was simple. There would be no more sacrifices. What a wonderful thought that was. God had provided once and for all the sacrifice of his son so we could be forgiven. We could walk in freedom. No longer the monkey on your back. No longer the monkey on my back. We're free. We are free. And because we're free, now we can love God fully and we can love people. And it's a beautiful thing. So simple. So organic. So pure. Our church strives to be an organic church. We try to focus on the main thing, not the additives. This is the way it was in the early church. The message of Christ was a positive message. We try to present a positive message. Psychologists are just now catching up with what Jesus knew a long time ago. They're now coming around to the idea that good teaching is positive teaching. It's not based on the negative. It's based on positive when I went to school, and when you went to school, what did teachers say? Stop running down the hall! But now they're learning there's better ways to say it. You need to be walking. Same thing. It's just the kids who get no, no, don't, stop, quit, all the time. They've just made it positive. But it's the same message. The Old Testament, don't, 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 don't. Don't do this, don't do that. Don't do this, don't do that. Jesus comes along and he says, love God, love people, love yourself. You get the difference? It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing. Now, let me show you this. I went over at Mike and Laura Murphy's house the other day, and I was going to ask Mike to help me build a prop for the sermon. So I had this idea of what I wanted. And so as I'm beginning to talk to him about the prop that I need, I see sitting on their patio something 10 times better than I had envisioned for the prop. And I said, can I borrow this? And they said, yes. So what I want to do is I want to use this to kind of represent for us organic Christianity. The death of Christ on the cross, no longer sacrifices needed. God's, God, is, um, God loves us. We don't have to worry about are we good enough. God loves us. That's settled once and for all. Jesus says don't worry about that anymore. And now the message is simple. We're going to love God with all of our hearts and we're going to love our neighbors as ourselves. That's the beautiful organic message of the cross. It's going to be simple. It's going to be easy. It's that simplicity of Christ. Paul talked about the simplicity of Christ. Don't let Satan beguile you. Don't drift away from the simplicity of Christ. Now, while that is so beautiful and so right, it gets mixed up a lot in churches. And I don't fault churches. We all are trying to do good. We're all trying to read the book. We're all trying to read the book and do what the book says. 
But we quickly drift away, and so people outside of the church end up not seeing this, but they see something else. And I wanted to just kind of illustrate it with a couple of things that I think would be helpful. Uh, one of the things that churches have to struggle with is how are people saved? So I brought this, okay? How are people saved? And there's different opinions about how that needs to happen. People read the Bible, but they come up with all kinds of different ideas. For example, Catholics. Catholics say, well, it's being baptized as a baby. That's, that's the most important thing. And, and their heart's in the right place, you know, they, they, they want people to grow up and to know Christ, and they don't want, it all came from the idea that if somebody died before they were old enough to make a decision for Christ, then they wouldn't go to heaven, oh my goodness, we've got to fix that, so we'll baptize them as babies, then they'll be covered. And so that becomes part of the message, but then I grew up Baptist, and Baptist, we say, no, no, you've got to receive Christ as your Savior, receive Christ as your Savior, that's the big deal. But then some people went to a Billy Graham crusade. I went to a Billy Graham crusade when he was in Atlanta. Back when I was a kid, I actually went forward on Atlanta Fulton County Stadium on the field, not to get saved. I wanted to stand on the pitcher's mound. But anyway, they, I got counted. <laughs> I was just a boy. I went down, they counted me, and, but I didn't get saved really. But their big deal was to pray the sinner's prayer. You have to pray the sinner's prayer. And then there are other, there's others, I, I don't know where I stuck it, there's another one, that uh, apostolic churches, some of you know a little bit about apostolic churches, there it's, um, you've got to just say the name of Jesus, and so they get saved by saying Jesus, 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 until they're saved. And so it's like, okay, our cross, that beautiful organic Christianity, it's getting a little bit, a little bit uh, cluttered up. Well, what about something as simple as baptized? We all know that that's important, so let me put baptism here. In fact, baptism in many places is a part of salvation. So we'll kind of put that there and uh, bend that over. But then when you get to baptism, there's all kind of arguments that people have about how you're baptized. Methodists, for example, believe that you're sprinkled. Have any people that were sprinkled as Methodist? Anybody here? Oh, a few. Okay, a few. But Baptist, we believe, I was raised Baptist, that you have to be immersed. You have to be placed under the water. That baptize means baptizo, to immerse or to plunge. And then people from uni uni United Pentecostal backgrounds believe you've got to go totally under the water. If you don't go totally under the water, you don't go to heaven. If your nose misses it just a little bit, you don't go. I'm not making this up. I'm not making this up. They also believe that you have to be baptized in the name of Jesus only. And so, I was baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Some people believe you're baptized in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, the name of the Holy Spirit. Some people say, no, if you're baptized that way, you don't go to heaven. You've got to just be baptized in the name of Jesus only. So, I didn't know what to do as a young preacher. I was confused. So I'd baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, then the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then in Jesus only, I'd hold them under, make sure they're submerged. They'd come up, I'd sprinkle a little water in their face, and we'd cover it all the way, all the way. But that's kind of what the world sees. They see this as kind of the way we operate. Well, then there's people who say, no, that's okay, but you also have to understand the Trinity. How many of you understand the Trinity? Anybody understand the Trinity? Y'all are way better than me. Way better than me. The Trinity is one of the most confusing things. Let me tell you different things. There's, there's one view of the Trinity that is traditional Christianity. It's what we believe here that believes that uh, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, co-eternal, co-equal. Co-eternal, co-equal. Co-eternal, co-equal. So that's one view. But there are other people that are Christians. T.D. Jakes comes out of a denomination that doesn't believe that. They believe in something called modalism. Or uh, Sabellianism is another way that it's called. And that, that teaches that the Father ceased to be when Jesus came to the earth, and then the Father was operating as the Son. And then when the Son died, he now operates as the Holy Spirit. So, and that's a whole different thing, but it's, not, it's, it's like, wow. And then we had somebody at our church a long time ago that believed if you didn't understand the Trinity, you couldn't be saved. And so her mission was to explain to teenagers the Trinity. I have sat in graduate-level classes with PhDs discussing the Trinity. 
Why would we think a 13-year-old is going to understand the Trinity? Jesus never talked about the Trinity. It wasn't even articulated as a church doctrine until 400 years after the time of Christ. It wasn't a part of, of His message. His message was, let my sacrifice on the cross cover your sins. Love God with all your heart. Love people. But we add to it. And it begins to get a little cluttered. Well, some people say, yeah, well, the big deal is you've got to make sure we keep the commandments because the commandments, you know, that's a big deal. And, and, I, and I love the Ten Commandments. Um, I can actually name the Ten Commandments. How many of you think you can name the Ten Commandments? We get a few of them, but most people have trouble naming them. I used to have a guy come to see me all the time when we were in Stockbridge, and he wanted me to put a big sign out in the front yard of our church honoring the Ten Commandments. Now, y'all, please don't think I'm sacrilegious. That is the farthest thing from my mind of what I want to put out on the front yard of the church is the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments lets us know how far we miss it. The Ten Commandments judge us. The Ten Commandments um, send us to eternity away from God. It's the grace of Jesus. It's the grace of God through Christ that saves us. So it's like, I was gracious, but it's like, sir... That's not the big deal, but, but people think the Ten Commandments are the big deal. Uh, you, you know, no other God before me, and it's important to keep that, but we miss that. We put other things in front of God. We always do. No graven images. That's when you make something to be God that's not supposed to be made God, but we make it to be God or using God's name in vain. And it doesn't just mean saying God blank. It could mean just using God in a, in a non-holy way, in a way that's not the way he's supposed to be honored, but that's, that's another thing. Or, or remember the Sabbath. Oh my goodness, the Sabbath is Saturday. Y'all know the Sabbath is Saturday. So what do we do? We mess that up. Honor your parents. Have y'all done that perfectly your whole life? I haven't done that perfectly. I mess that up sometimes. Stealing. Anybody here steal? Since we've been to hate bill, we've lost two computers, a sound system. I don't know who's doing it, but somebody's doing it. There's stealing going on. Killing, I don't know about killing, but I'm sure there's some, some of that that people can relate to. Adultery, uh-oh. Um, lying. <laughs> coveting. I mean, it, 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 we got to do all this stuff, right? So suddenly our cross is kind of losing a little bit of its beauty. And then people say, well, the most important thing is holiness. And I love the song the praise team sang just a moment ago because holiness is really important. God's otherness, his separateness. You see God and you say, holy, 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 because he is so separate from us. He is so beyond us. And we are to be holy people. But then there's all this talk about what does holiness mean? And there are people that say, well, what it means is women need to cover their heads in church. And, and y'all, there's still a substantial number of people around the world that say that's, that's the big deal. You heathen women who aren't covering your heads in church, you need to be covering your heads in church. And so I've gone to churches, maybe you have too, where the heads are covered, women always have their heads covered. Then I've been to churches where women can't cut their hair because there's a scripture about that long hair. Some of you short-haired women, <laughs> not good. I've been to churches where men have to have short hair. Some of you long hair, dusty. <laughs> I don't know, you could go there. I've been to churches where women could not wear pants. That became the big deal. Women could not wear pants. They let you slide the first week, but they let you know. You can't come, because there's a verse in the Bible that says women shouldn't dress like men, and so they make that what that's all about. So no pants. Of course, there are churches, no smoking. Um, Mirik, my Polish pastor friend, he came to the States the first time. He came out of a church that smoking was the worst sin in the whole wide world. And in his mind at that time, Merrick is now the most progressive preacher. He is, he is a village guy. He, he gets it. I'm so happy. But when he first came, we were in Hale Haven Shopping Center. He didn't get any of it. And uh, he thought if you smoked, you went to hell. That's what he thought. If you smoked, you went to hell. And so he stood up to speak. And I was nervous because we have all these, I mean, we were just starting. We have all these earthy people in our church, right? Still, just earthy, good people, and they're there. But a few of them smoked. A bunch, actually, at the time. <laughs> and Merrick, Merrick, in his broken English and his very stern delivery back then, different now, he said, I saw a car yesterday in the United States. It had fish on bumper. And he said, I pull up beside it, and man, smoking. 
I tell you the truth, if that man dies, car goes straight to heaven, man goes straight to hell. <laughs> and uh, I thought, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. <laughs> no drinking. You know, I, I grew up in a church that uh, drinking, I, I, we were teetotalers, there was no drinking in our, in our church, and uh, I understand people have trouble with that, and so we, we honored the fact that people have trouble with that, but we've certainly learned that a glass of wine with a meal, people do it all over the world, and if it's something that you can handle without it, it being a problem for you, then we don't see trouble. Do you know the, there are some churches holes in your ears? The Bible says you're not supposed to cut your body, and so they make that just a really big deal. Um, tattoos, some of you tattoo people, marking your body. Other verses about abominations. Somebody will say, you know, the Bible says that homosexuality is an abomination. It says that in the Old Testament, it does. It also says that if you mix fabrics in your clothes, it's an abomination. That means if you're wearing a cotton polyester blend, <laughs> abomination, abomination. People say, the Bible says homosexuals are to be stoned. You know what it also says if your children, smart Matthew, they're to be stoned. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. That's crazy when people do that. But. And then there's more. There's the translations we use. Translations. That becomes... Y'all, I went to a church, I was made to feel like I had a Playboy magazine. I went to a church to see a cousin of mine ordained. And I'm standing with my new international version of the Bible, I'm going for his ordination service, and as the minister began to preach, he began to talk about the King James Version 1611 is the only authorized version of the Bible. It was the Bible in the way he spoke that Jesus used. Well, Jesus didn't speak 1611 King's English, I guarantee you that, but... He didn't understand anything about how translations were done. He just knew that that was the one he was raised on, and so that was the only right one. And he was so ugly towards any other translation, I found myself feeling like I had pornography in my hand because of what he was saying. And then some people say, no, it's, you can use the NIV. And then they came out with a translation a few years ago called the TNIV, the new... Uh, uh, it was a translation that actually was going to where it says only things that were... Uh, male geared, but they were, because of the culture it was written in, for example, if it says, if a brother offends you, they would simply say, if a brother or sister offends you. That's all they did is change that. They didn't make God anything different. It was just, they made that, and church leaders loved it. But then a few people began to complain about it, and now the TNIV is not sold anywhere. Bookstores have banned it because they say it's this horrible thing, and it wasn't a hard, horrible thing. But that becomes the translation issue, becomes a horrible deal. And then some people say, well, it's the second coming of Christ that's the most important thing, the second coming of Jesus. We need to be talking about the second coming of Jesus. And I grew up in a church that was so sure of how it was going to work out. And so I grew up understanding it. I, I believed it. I knew it. I knew it exactly. The Left Behind series, I knew all that stuff before the Left Behind series. I knew all of that. I did not realize that that view of trans, translating the second coming did not even exist until the 1850s. Nobody had ever translated the Bible ever like that until the 1850s. And an Englishman by the name of John Darby began to translate the Bible that way. Another preacher by the name of Schofield said, I like that translation. And so he produced a Bible called the Schofield Study Bible and put that in as the notes. And then Baptists and Pentecostals in the South primarily adopted that as the only view of how Jesus was going to return. And so there are people that will absolutely kill you if you don't believe the way they believe on the second coming of Christ. It has never been taught that way until 150 years ago, and then it's only taught in fundamentalist camps. It's not taught in churches around the world that way. And then there's questions about, well, will Jesus come back before the tribulation? That's the pre-trib. Christians, and then some people say, no, it's mid-trib, there'll be seven years of tribulation, but he'll come in three and a half years of the tribulation, and then some people say, no, you'll go through the tribulation, but then you'll be raptured afterward, that's post-trib, and so you have churches that will absolutely fight you over those things, and I'm thinking, this is ugly, 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 and then some people say, well, the deal is you've got to have an altar call, because if you don't have an altar call, then people can't really get saved, and they don't realize until Charles Finney preached in the 19th century, Charles Finney in the 19th century, there had never been an altar call. Never in the history of the church, 
2,000 years, there had never been, come to Jesus, if you want to get saved, come down the aisle. Charles Finney did it in 1870. And then Dwight Moody did it. And then Billy Graham did it. And then churches in the South, Baptist churches, Pentecostal churches began to do it. And so people who grew up in that background say, well, it's not church if you don't invite people to walk the, down to the altar to, to receive Jesus. And it's like, where's the simplicity of the gospel? Where is the simplicity of the message? I get wanting to spend time discussing all of this stuff. But what does the world see when they look at us? Y'all want to join that? I don't want to join that. I want to get back to, and some people think it's shallow, and they think it's shallow because they don't understand it's the message of Christ. Jesus had a lot to say to Pharisees about all of their rules and all their regulations and all of their... Uh, things that they wanted to do to exclude people. Jesus said there's a simplicity here. Love God. Love people. Like you love yourself. And because he died on a cross, and he did, we don't have to worry about are we good enough. That was covered. He covered that. So with pen in hand, I want to give you just a couple of quick thoughts that this is just why, why the big deal about the organic message of Jesus, and then we'll be ready to leave, all right? First thing I want you to write down is this. The organic message of Jesus was central to his crucifixion. It was central to his crucifixion. In other words, he was crucified precisely because he preached the simplistic message that I have shared with you today. The Pharisees hated him because he said, you guys sure come up with a lot of laws. You sure beat a lot of people up with those Old Testament scriptures, and yet I see in you no mercy and I see in you no grace. Uh, you say, did he really say it like that? May I read for you a couple of scriptures? Matthew chapter 23. This is his most famous diatribe against the Pharisees. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, verse 1, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads, and they put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Listen to verse 15. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and then you've succeeded. When you've succeeded, you make him twice as much a child of hell as you are. Verse 23. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tithe of your spices, your mint, your dill, your cumin, but you have neglected the more important issues, uh, the issues of justice and mercy and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain at a gnat, but you swallow a camel. Verse 25, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you clean the outside of the cup. But inside you are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees, why don't you clean the inside of the cup? Woe to you, verse 27, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside they're full of dead men's bones. Jesus is saying to people who are trying to put it all over here and making this elaborate deal, he's trying to say, it's simple. Love God. Love your neighbor. It's simple. Write this down. Number two, the organic message of Jesus was central to the world changing for the better. You don't have to write this down. We put it in for you. Central to the world changing for the better after his resurrection. The world changed. And the world changed because Christians were Christians. They loved God and they loved people. Oh, they loved people. When, when diseases would sweep through towns, it was Christians who would take care of the sick. Because they knew they were supposed to love their neighbors as themselves. The world became a better place because Christians loved God. They loved their neighbors. And they were grateful to God because the sacrifice had been given. One final thought. The organic message of Jesus is what is necessary for your life to be lived abundantly now. The organic message of Jesus is what is necessary for you to live an abundant life now. 
I really believe some of us strive so hard. We have, a, we have something on our back, just, we just feel like we're not good enough. Can I tell you something? When you gaze, if you could see Christ on the cross and you could just gaze into his eyes, you would realize that that's gone. That's gone. God says, don't worry about that. My son's death was enough. You're okay. You're okay. And then if you would look into the eyes of Jesus, you would discover how absolutely important it is, once you love God with all your heart, to spread your arms and love other people. It's simple. I love this quote. Augustine said this. Church Father Augustine said this. Love God, then do as you please. Isn't that a great thought? Love God. You say, what are the rules of the village church, Ray? Love God, then do whatever you want to do. Because I just have faith in you. If you love God, you're going to do the right things. You're going to want to do the right things. You're going to be a loving, caring, compassionate person. I want you to bow your heads. I'm going to ask Ray to come up. I want him to sing a song that I think is going to just put a nice little cap on what we've talked about today. But Father, I pray right now for every person's here. I pray that they will never get out of their mind that cross with all of that stuff added to it. And they will remember the words of Jesus when he said, Love God and love your neighbors. All the law and the prophets can be hanged on that. Love God and love your neighbors. May we get back to the simplicity of the gospel. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I've seen a lot of crazy things done in your name. I know the tricks behind the magic show I've almost thrown the towel in a time or two and I've walked away from everything I know and I can't feel this emptiness inside of me all the troubled waters of my mind So if you're really out there and you're listening then Prove to me that those who seek will find If you can just see fit to show me some of who you are you can shed some light into this broken sinner's heart. I need to know the truth and I need something I can feel. I need you to make it real. The reason why you brought me here Through valleys where the shadows hover close Oh, down here there's a mask to cover everything With Your sweet face I long to see the most There's just the slightest hope for me Despite all my questions and my doubts Then let me hear your still small voice speak out my name And let me know what others talk about Show me some of who you are. If you 